Hi, I'm Ken Rockburn, and welcome to Rockburn Presents. He's probably the most famous dad in Canada, the father of the great one. Walter Gretzky is probably just as recognizable as his famous son, Wayne. But Walter Gretzky has faced and overcome a battle that left him with huge chunks of his memory gone. He suffered a stroke that almost did him in, but through sheer effort, the kind that characterized his son's hockey playing, actually, Walter came back, and he says he came back a better person. Tonight, Rockburn presents a conversation with Walter Gretzky. Walter, usually when I do these interviews with people, I start uh, with their early life and sort of go, you know, kind of chronologically in a way. But, mm -hmm. but I think with you, I want to do it because of, of what happened to you and the significance of what happened to you and how it affected what you remembered of your early life. I wanted to start sort of after the event and then maybe go kind of back and forth a little bit. Um, in the book, you talk about how not long after your stroke, you wanted to go, you asked to go to your father's grave. You didn't know why, you just knew that you wanted to go there. Yeah. And when you got there, something happened to you that was that that really took you by surprise. Well, I asked <clears throat> Phyllis picked me up at the hospital. She was uh, we we're going to the farm, and and uh, I remember saying to her my exact words. I remember exactly. I said, "Mama, going to be there," and she didn't say anything. I asked her a second time, she, she didn't say anything. And but I thought she was just thinking about something and just was preoccupied. And uh, so I didn't think anything of it. And she, she, w she drove straight to the cemetery. And uh, we always looked after um, my dad's uh, spot there mm -hmm. with the flowers and everything. And, and I looked at his name, and then that's when I first knew that my mother had died. Because you had no recollection. No. And that had only happened, what, three years <clears throat> earlier, is yeah. that right? Later on, I remembered, I remembered uh, uh, that she had died. Mm -hmm. I remember that. But it wasn't until I, I saw her uh, name, mm -hmm. born, and died. Yeah. See, I ask you about that because I think that that really <clears throat> sharply illustrates the, what, how awful this is when something like this happens to somebody. Yeah. You just, you lose, you lost so much, right? Yeah. Most of the time from the early 70s or the mid-70s to the mid-90s, end of the 90s, doesn't exist for me. Mm -hmm. I said to the doctor, how come a couple of things I can remember and other things I just don't remember? He said, you'll remember what's most important to you if you're going to remember anything. And it's so true. I remember my mom. Um, I remember, uh, which I often mention, Mario Lemieux scoring that goal, top right-hand corner. I remember that because <laughs> I was standing behind the net. I remember that. Okay. All right. I remember Wayne's wedding. Yeah. I remember him standing out there at the altar, bouncing on his heels up and down. He was nervous. And Janet coming up the aisle. And uh, I remember Tim Fian, a Canadian singer, a friend of Wayne's, sang from the balcony, Odes of Joy. I can remember that. And the other thing I remember is uh, my dad's funeral. But I just remember the church service. remember my mom's. remember that. And that's pretty well lit. A few other things I remember. You said to me, a little, just before we started doing this interview, and you were talking about how you'd smoked most of your life yeah. and you don't anymore. Yeah. And, and you were mentioning how when you, when all, after all of this had happened, mm -hmm. you were still searching for cigarettes, even though you, you weren't entirely That's sure right. what you were doing. But you said, what, what caught me about when you d were describing that was you said you didn't know, you didn't I, even know if you were a human being. I didn't even know I was on this earth, and yet I knew to look for cigarettes. I was always going like this and saying, who's got my cigarettes? I was always looking for cigarettes. I did smoke for 34 yeah. years. I don't smoke now. It doesn't bother me. I can't believe I yeah. did that for 34 years. But is it, when you describe what you <laughs> felt like at, at that time, what, I mean, can, can you put it into words, what it was like? What, where, where you, after, where you after existed? After my stroke? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't have much of a memory of that whatsoever. The odd thing I remember is it's very sketchy for me. Yeah. I just, uh, was it a frightening feeling, though, to only have these patchy, these patchy memories? You mean right now? Or then or now? No, because really, what you don't know about, you never think about, mm -hmm. so you never miss. It's, but after my, my stroke, the operation, when I came out of that, I spoke to everybody, but not in the, not in the 
well, English, the first language I ever learned, which was Ukrainian. My parents were European. I learned that first. And of course, my wife's English, and uh, she, she, she was very distraught about the whole thing. And I told her, I don't know what you're concerned about. You don't listen to me in English anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, I spoke in Ukrainian really? to everyone. But I have no memory of that. Yeah. Now, going back do you, uh, to, your, to your childhood mm -hmm. and when you were raised and everything, yeah. do you now have the memories of that? Or oh, I always did that. Did. I remember, for example, the first day I went to school. Mm -hmm. I was five years old. I remember my mother was on my left side. She was holding this hand. We were walking up the hill in the country. I was going to school. And she said to me, I remember her exact words, Walter, don't be afraid going to school. Going into the school is just like coming into the house. I remember that. And yet five years ago, 10 years ago, I can't remember, 15 years ago, I can't remember, uh, if you said to me, go to the vehicle you just came in, to this building mm -hmm. right now. I have no idea where we're parked. I don't even know what kind of vehicle yeah. it is. I know we came in a car. That's yeah. all I know. And I know where I came Don't with. worry about it, because half the time I can't find mm -hmm. where I parked my car <laughs> in this garage either. So, <laughs> so we're in the same boat there. So, so all of those, so you have those very vivid memories, as many of us do, specific things yeah, in our yeah. youth. But, but do you also remember like the whole, your whole growing up period? I mean, yeah, you do. Yeah, up, uh, until, up until the early 70s, middle 70s, mm -hmm. I can remember that. Okay. All that very well. Yeah. That's no problem. Have they ever been able to tell you why it's at a certain point that things start to evaporate? Well, I asked him, how come some things I can remember and other things I can't? And he told me, first of all, we have two memories two different parts of the brain, I guess, long-term and short-term. Mm -hmm. I never knew that. I thought you had one memory, it's either good or bad. And uh, uh, he said, if you're going to remember anything, you'll remember what's most important to you. Yeah. And then he asked me the things I remembered, which were the things I told you. Yeah. And he said, see, that's what you're going to remember. That's obviously very important, important to you, which it is. Yeah. You had... I mean, this was a brush with death, but you had a brush with mm. death when you were a younger man, too, didn't you? Yeah, I had an accident at uh, Bell Canada. I had a frame hit me in the back of the head. I had a construction helmet on. It split my helmet in half. It fractured my skull, severed all my nerves. I'm totally deaf in my right ear from that. And if you've ever put a seashell to your ear, it goes shh. Mm -hmm. I have that 24 hours all a the day. Time? All the time. So you have it now. You can hear yeah, that sound now. Yeah, yeah. And it's worse when I think about it or I mention it. Oh, and, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, there's nothing can be done about it. It's the yeah. nerve ends being agitated. Yeah. He said, there isn't a surgeon in the world who would attempt to do anything yeah. about it. How old were you when that happened? Um, I was born in 38. It was in 64. OK, all right. And so that noise has been there with you ever since, that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, ever since, yeah. OK. Now, tell me what you were, I, I, I asked this because I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about yeah. how you are now, but I want to talk about how you were then. Um, you, you were, you, in the book you talk about yourself being a, uh, well, I guess now they describe you as a type A personality. Mm -hmm. you, you were just like, go, go, go. You worried about everything. Mm -hmm. You stayed up late at night most of the time. I did. Right? I did. Well, how would you describe your personality? Now? No, then. Time was always of the essence. Yeah? <laughs> I was always on the go. I never ate proper meals, um, well, with four boys and a girl, all involved in sports. Didn't have time to eat properly, uh, going to tournaments, going to hockey games, uh, track meets, get home late at night, go to work in the morning or go to school, you know, things like that. I, I try to get regular yeah. sleep now. You were consumed by all of this back then, though, right? <clears throat> it was everything. Yeah. yeah. He, the surgeon said I was a walking time bomb. Yeah. You didn't know that at the time, no, though, did you? No, no. He, f he found uh, old uh, uh, blood clots, not blood clots, mm -hmm. but... Uh, Scars? Scar, scar, yeah. scar tissue, rather. Meaning I've had many strokes before, M-I-N-I -I strokes, the bleed before. I never, ever knew it. And I mm. haven't had a single headache since I had yeah. my stroke. Now, when you were doing all this stuff with your, with your family and you're running around and you're doing all of this. It was, um, you said in the book that there were certain things that you, that you liked and there were certain things you didn't like, but hockey was one of the things that for you was always, that was one of your loves. It was right? the world. It was the world. <clears throat> Where did that come from, do you know, in you? Why was that? Well, when I, when I was young, I played minor hockey 
And being out in the country, there aren't many things to do there. You have the river, the ice, I had a pair of skates, hockey stick, and a puck. So that's what you did in the mm -hmm. winter time. All the boys just played hockey, and in the summertime, you you played the uh, scrimmage ball. You started, and you also talk in the book about how you know you had a camera and you started taking pictures of yeah. your kids when they were playing and yeah. stuff, which is why Wayne's career right. is basically chronicled from the minute he picked up a stick <laughs> until now, right? Well, well, the reason I did that was I've always believed, like this moment, you and myself, it'll never ever happen again. If it's not captured on film, you can't you can't make a picture of that tomorrow or next year. Right. I always love love to have. So uh, you wanted to chronicle that. Yeah, yeah. I always did. I don't know why. I just reason yeah. only reason because of what I told you. A lot of people do that. Do you go back and look at them <clears throat> very often? No. 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 So you got them, but you don't go back yeah. and look at them. Now, why is that? <laughs> having a good time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> good time. <laughs> All right. You also said something in the book which I thought was interesting. You talk about how the how being on the uh, so close to the spotlight all the time because of Wayne and because yeah. of his accomplishments and so on. That and you made you made a reference in the book to some <laughs> of the th that you that you've seen and had to deal with some pretty strange things. You've said that pe a lot of people were very nice, but you also had to deal with all that. that there was some some strangeness in there. How strange did things get when suddenly you had a boy that was as the well, focus of so much attention? <clears throat> First of all, people think I have a hockey stick factory in the backyard, and of course, you know, like everybody else, Wayne sits there 24 hours a day signing sticks. You know that. <laughs> and uh, some of the strange things that people run up on the front lawn, grab grass, grass off the lawn, take it for a souvenir. Grass? Grass. Just handfuls of grass. That's pretty strange, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, we, at, at one time when Wayne was in a peak of his career, now we have the green garbage bags. I do remember this. We have the green garbage bags. They're, they're all tied. But at one time, you had the, the big cans, you know, the yeah. Yeah, metal cans. Yeah. And you just threw your garbage in there. Mm -hmm. No bags or anything. Mm -hmm. People would come and go through the garbage, look for souvenirs. Remember that. How bizarre did you think that was? <laughs> it shook my head. <laughs> I remember I was, a, I was on a flight to Edmonton one time. Wayne wanted me to come out because he said he's going to break Gordy's record. Yeah. He just got nicely in the air, reached into the front pouch, and I pulled out a magazine, Sports Illustrated, when he's on the front cover, because he's going to break one of Gordy's big records. Lady sitting beside me, notice that's how he's ladies. Lady sitting beside me said, I see you're reading Boeing Gretzky. I said, yeah. She said, then she said, you know, I don't know how the devil he ever made it in the NHL. He's <laughs> lucky he's got all those good players on his team. All he ever does is stand in front of that, score all the goals, get all the money and the glory. Everybody else does all the darn work. I turn the pages fast, first three or four pages are on wing, close the book up, turn it around, put his face the other way, put it back in the pouch. I said, you're going to Edmonton, are you? She said, yeah, and I remember exactly what she said. Our daughter got married three months ago. I'm going to see how they're doing. Who are you going to see? That caught me by surprise. I remember I stuttered. I, I didn't think about her asking me that. And, and, and they said, oh, we got a son out there. Anyways. As you know, on a long flight, they give you breakfast right away, yeah. early in the morning. She came by, she's standing opposite me, says to the lady next to the window, Mrs. Jones, what do you decide on? I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's going to call me by my name. I'm in the first class section, call me by your name. <laughs> then she said, Mrs. Smith, and then she got to me. And Mr. Gretzky, here's Mrs. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> You're going out to Edmonton to see your son Wayne play tonight. Understand he's going to break Gordy's record. I sure wish I could be there. Where our food came, I watched her. She didn't touch her eggs, her bacon, her toast. She drank most of her coffee. <laughs> and you know, served her right, but I felt, felt so bad for her. Did she ever say anything to you? No, they, I'm coming tonight. I took a piece of the white of the egg, I ate a piece of bacon and a piece of toast and drank my coffee. Worst fight I had in my life for the next two and a half hours, this is how the two of us were, side by side. It was <laughs> awful. So now when somebody says something about Wayne, right away I try to make a joke of it, Sam is dad, you know. <laughs> That's right. Cut them off at the pass right before it happens. But it happens. That happens. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. You you have the stroke, and you also you write about afterwards how you get taken to games and stuff. Yeah. And you're thinking about when the game's going to be over, so you can go just, home. Apparently, I had no interest whatsoever. I don't have much of a memory for that whatsoever. Yeah. I don't remember doing that. But but also when Wayne's uh, games were on TV, my friends would come over. 
And halfway through, I would, apparently I would just say, I'm going to bed. I would up and I would go. I would never, ever do that. Nobody could even make a sound when Wayne was playing in a house. That must have floored everybody when you it said did. stuff like that. Apparently it did. <clears throat> now, when you were in the hospital, a lot of people came to see you. Yeah. They had Gordy Howe come to see yeah, you. Yeah, he did. Bobby Orr Bobby come to Orr, see you. Yeah. Do you remember all of those things no. at all? You don't, eh? None. None. You were told about None. it afterwards. Uh, Colleen House told me that uh, her and Gordy came to see me, and she she said, I said to you, Walter, you know who this is? And apparently I answered, according to her, of course, that's Mr. Howe. So I did know him. Yeah. He was there somewhere in your head, yeah. right? Yeah. You had a therapist who helped you through those, yep. those rough stages. He's now part of your family. He's now your son-in-law, right? He sure is, yeah. yeah. Ian. Yeah. Tell me about what you remember about what you went through with him that got you back so that you could be sitting here with me today having this conversation. Well, I was in the hospital for 10 months. He was my therapist there. And then after I left the hospital, he left the hospital, and he stayed with me on a permanent basis. Like, he would come every day from morning till night, and he'd stay with me for two and a half years. I hardly remember any of that, mm -hmm. and, and but I, I uh, know that he would he would say all I ever wanted to do was sleep. I just but I was on a lot of medication. Yeah. He would have a tough time waking me up in the morning. And I would sleep have sleeps in the afternoon after my lunch. I would always sleep for an hour, hour and a half apparently. But I hardly remember that. And we would do a lot of things like he would take me to uh, take me skating, take me to the gymnasium, play a little bit of basketball and things like that. Apparently, I didn't want to do any of that. And he kind of would push, push, stand, actually physically stand behind me and push me around the gym floor so that I would run. Yeah. But I have no memory of that. There were, I, I know that, that they would put you through a regimen, right? There would be lists and they would ask you questions. And yeah. Is the idea yeah. there that if, they, that if they did this often enough that what, the things would come back to That's you? That's right, yeah, yeah. For example, when I was in the hospital for the 10 months, I lost that period of time. So to me, our children weren't grow, growing up. They were all little children like that. And I was always looking for them, apparently, and especially the youngest one, Brent. I would always say, where's Brent? Who's got Brent? Who's got Brent? And he's already grown up. So they would put pictures on the, they, or they put pictures on the wall of all the children so I could relearn who they were, because apparently I didn't even know who they were. Yeah. Uh, how, how long did it take before things started to turn around and you started to get a handle on, on it again? Four or five years. That long? Yeah. Ian, I was in the hospital for 10 months. Ian stayed with me for two and a half years, about about four years, three yeah. and a half, four years. And and your recollection of that period of time, no. it just was non-existent. Yeah. The odd thing, the odd thing, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But I, I I do remember that I always looked forward to Ian making me lunch. I remember that. I always remember that. Did you do? Did you read or or watch television or movies or anything? I mean, were you no, doing things? No, apparently I didn't want to do any of that. No, I wasn't interested in that at all. They said I just wasn't interested. People would take me for walks, like my neighbors. They would take me for walks, because when I came out of the hospital, I weighed 188 pounds, and I'm normally 152, right. 153, but just laying in a hospital bed all that time. What about your personality? <clears throat> I mean, it's different. I know and there's a, you, you make a lot in the book about the fact, and, and, and your friends do too, because they <clears throat> appear in your book as well talking about you, that you seem now to have boundless energy. You have time for everybody. Well, yeah. You're a different guy. Apparently they say I am, but, well, one thing I know, every second of every day is precious to me. Every second, sitting here, looking at you, talking to you, that's something special. I wasn't supposed to be able to do that. So every second is special to me, yeah. and I try to make the best out of every moment of every day. When you go back and look at, um, I guess, I mean, most people would mm -hmm. think this, so I have to ask you this. Yeah. Uh, when you have um, a son who is so well-known and so accomplished as Wayne is, yeah. uh, does it disturb you at all that maybe there are parts of your life that you shared with him and all of those accomplishments that are gone for you forever no, that you only know no, about? No, because what you don't know about, you never ever think about, mm. so you never ever miss. 
I know you've never had a hundred million dollars, so you never think of that, so you never miss it. Well, actually, I think about so it fairly often, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk to your kids about <clears throat> about the periods of time that you don't have a recollection of to yeah, see if you can. Yeah, I'll fill ask in. them, or they'll remind me, or tell me, mm -hmm. and I try to relearn and put it in its proper time frame. And have you managed to do that? I mean, have things come have have things come back to you unexpectedly in the last little while? No, no. They're pretty I just much have gone to forever. Relearn, yeah. Yeah, and he told me that. He told me that right off the bat, the, the doctor, that I, I wouldn't re remember. That, they, I, that there's some things would just never yeah. come back. He said, I'll have to relearn. Yeah, nothing comes back. Yeah. Even when I look at a picture or a book, that doesn't remind me of anything. It doesn't remind me. And your family? You have enough memories of them, the important oh, things. Yeah, the when they're all young. Yeah, I remember that. Remember them. So they still yeah. they still exist for you in other parts of their lives as well as yeah. as now. I'd, I'd like to mention a one one good thing that's come from it. Yeah. Uh, part of my therapy was golfing for the walking, the coordination, mm -hmm. exercise, and my golf game has improved. Like you wouldn't believe. Now you it's, used to hate golf, awesome. didn't you? Oh, I in did. Your, in, yeah. in your other life, yeah, you were not a golf fan at all. No, never, never. I hated it, but I'm so good anymore. The only, only, uh, the only problem is uh, <clears throat> everybody says <laughs> that I cheat, but I just don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, so you're, now let me get this straight. This, this has its advantages, too. Is that what you're telling That's me? That's what I'm I saying, yeah. I, I had a three on that hole. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> it wasn't a five. <laughs> yeah, okay. But I, I do play a lot for the exercise and yeah. just the coordination. Yeah. Because I remember I couldn't walk. I remember that. Until the day you can't walk, you realize how precious it is to walk. I remember that. I remember that. The, the, um, you did this book because the folks at the, at the Heart and Stroke Foundation yeah. approached you. And it's very yeah. interesting because in the preface of this book, they write about going to your door and being worried that you, that you would just be either too busy or not interested mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were, I think... I suspect from the way they have written this, a little blown away by the fact that you were more than willing to do this. And you've taken on quite a big, I mean, you're going around now. This is not just yeah. your story, but you're, you're trying to let other people know. Yeah. Well, it's so sad that so many people don't know the signs and symptoms of stroke. And if they did, they would be alive today. And, not, and, and those who are still alive wouldn't be paralyzed yeah. for the rest of their lives, all for nothing. Because you know yourself, some people will get such a violent headache, they'll, they'll see two of everything, and, and they such, they're screaming mm -hmm. they got such a headache. Mm -hmm. Instead of going to the doctor, they take aspirins and go lay down, yeah. and they either never ever wake up, or when they wake up, they're partially paralyzed for the rest of their lives for nothing. You had those headaches, right? All of my life. And they were I real was, bad ones? So bad, I would sleep in a lazy boy chair just like this in a three-quarter position. I couldn't even move my head sideways. I would just be able to turn my eyes just a little. I had to keep my head just perfectly still. And I'd finally fall asleep and I'd wake up in the morning. She'd wake me up and I'd be, and go to work and then start again, just a warm, warm. And, and you I, never went to see about it? No, never, ever, never, ever. Why not, do you know? Why you didn't? Like I mean, most, most people, people would think after well, a while. I, but I always knew when I was going to get them. I would get them if I missed a couple of meals and didn't eat okay. till late at night, or if I only had three or four hours sleep and had to go to work or school the next day, I knew I would get them because yeah. of that. So you could always attribute it to something, right? Right, right, right. So you figure if you didn't do those <coughs> things, you wouldn't but get then, them. Then I wouldn't have gotten them. Yeah. So I never ever went to see for them. Never mm -hmm. ever. Do you have people coming up to you now as you go around talking about this who say, you know, I was just like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll have people come to the door. I'll say, can I help you? Well, it's personal. I say, well, come on in. They'll sit down. I'll say, what is it? We got a mo and I go through this all the time. We've got a mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, son, daughter. Go through them all. And they start crying. Who's only got two months or three months to live or a month to live. Can you come to the hospital and see them? Please come. And they're just crying. You weren't supposed to live the night. Maybe you'd be an inspiration to them. And they'll live just like you did. Will you come, please? Please? I get that all the time. What do you do? I go. Do you? Because you know what it means. Yeah. You talk in the book about you talk in the book about mm. a kid. The day that we're that we're taping this mm. interview is Halloween. 
And you talk in the book about a young boy who came to your door on Halloween and, and started asking you questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. <clears throat> it's a little boy across the road, and uh, they had moved there from the Windsor area. He wanted to go because uh, he could go to school in Bramford. Right. And his mom was talking to my wife, Phyllis, and the little boy started asking me questions. He's eight years old. And he has a very high IQ, this young man. And it wasn't until about the fourth question when he asked me this, and this tone of voice, well, Mr. Gretzky, how long was it after your medical mishap that you, eight years old, were able to speak to your friends and your family? Then I knew what he was doing. I'm an adult. He's eight years old. It was the fourth question. I remember that so well. He wasn't asking about me. He was asking about his dad. His dad had a stroke and he couldn't talk, he can't talk, and he's partially paralyzed. And that's not so bad because at least you can see him, but Daniel's totally visually impaired. So the little boy, eight years old, can't see his dad, and he can't talk to him. And he was wondering when he was gonna be able to talk to his dad. Boy. Yeah, I always remember that. Yeah. So we're pretty good friends. Good his, friends his, dad, his dad's yeah. doing good, he drives a vehicle now, and uh, uh, he can talk a little bit. He's doing really well. So will you just keep on doing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep I've, talking to those people? Yeah, I've been given a second chance, you know. So it's a privilege for me. Every second is special to me. And if I can help one person, then it's all worth it. Walter, it's been great of you to do this. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It was really Thank good you to for having you. me. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.